Hi, everyone. Welcome to Dean's Chat, where we discuss all things podiatric medicine. My name is Dr. Jeffrey Jensen. I'm the Dean at the Arizona College of Podiatric Medicine and the host for the Dean's Chat podcast. Once again, I'm joined by my co-host. Hi, Joe. Hey, Jeff. How are you doing? I'm doing wonderful. A very exciting guest today, an up-and-coming star in podiatric medicine, Dr. Ben Cullen from San Diego. Welcome to Dean's Chat, Ben. Hey, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. Well, we're already on an informal basis, so let's let's continue with it. We'll go with Ben and Joe and Jeff. How's that sound? Sounds great. Fantastic. Well, thank you again, Ben, so much for taking the time today to come talk with our listeners about your wealth of information and your own experiences. Um, there's so many fun things to unpack. I'm just going to do a, a brief intro for, for everyone that's listening. So Dr. Cullen did his undergraduate degree at University of California, Santa Cruz, and then went on to do his uh, podiatric medical school with the California School of Podiatric Medicine in Oakland, California, graduated in 2010, and went on to do the residency program with Kaiser. Hayward. Then uh, right out of residency, went down to San Diego and became the assistant director for the Scripps program and is currently the director, the residency director for the uh, Scripps Podiatric Surgical Residency Program in San Diego. So that's a lot of uh, accomplishment just in and of itself. But first, let's just start with tell us a little bit about the residency program. Um, very fortunate to have landed here. Um, Dr. Uh, Don Green was the program director uh, before me. Uh, when I was in training in Kaiser and Hayward and uh, Fremont, uh, one of my attendees, uh, Dr. Uh, John Steenstra, was uh, buddies with uh, Dr. Green and uh, knew that they were looking for someone uh, to come in and work with them. Uh, so I met Dr. Green and very much welcomed me into San Diego with uh, open arms. Um, and it's, an, it's an outstanding uh, program. Uh, we have a, a lot of diversity of attendings. We have a lot of diversity of institutions that the residents uh, train at, and they get exposed to just about everything in foot and ankle uh, pathology. So I'm very proud of uh, just trying to keep the momentum going with this, uh, what's been built uh, by the people before me. That's fabulous. That's um, funny story about uh, Don Green. When my mother had her bunions done in Wisconsin, they used to spend the winter in San Diego, and she was a patient of Dr. Green's, as small world nice. as it is. Very much. I think that's probably safe for a lot of people. Yeah, Don yeah. Green was a big name. He, he's another one that would be amazing if we could track him down, but I'm sure he's very much enjoying this second phase of his life. So how many residents do you guys take? So we take uh, four residents uh, per year, and um, we have nine at any given time down in San Diego in the third year. Uh, two of the residents go up into Kaiser in Sacramento, and then one resident goes up into Kaiser in uh, Fontana in, in Ontario. And how do they make those decisions? Uh, fortunately, we don't have any arm wrestling contests or anything uh, like that. We uh, do this at the match. So uh, based off of what uh, Crips fits out, um, they rank which places they want to go to. And uh, based off of the ranking, it's, it's uh, programmed at the start of residency. So they'll know that information right after match day. Exactly. Yeah. Right. That makes everybody's life easier, I imagine. Yes. <laughs> Well, Ben, I got to tell you, our students love coming to San Diego and rotating with you, and it's a very worthwhile month. Um, can you tell us about the clerkship program, too? I mean, uh, that's got to be a big part of the program, looking for prospective residents down the road. What does your clerkship look like? Yeah, and, um, so typically we'll have about uh, three students per uh, month uh, for most of the, the time, and we try to expose them to as much of the program as we can, have them rotate through uh, scripts as well as uh, Kaiser and uh, Sharp. Um, and a lot of the program is built off of having the underclass, the, the residents teach the underclassmen. So if they're near resident, teach the second year resident, teaches you know first and and the extra. So. Um, when the externs come here, we uh, do expect them to show up and to work, and um, we have them uh, make a presentation for us at, at the end of the month. Um, we have them uh, very much intimately involved in our workshops, so cadaver labs, um, journal clubs, um, the te academic teaching sessions, and they're very active in the clinic setting as well. They work up the patients, uh, they mm -hmm. present to the attendees, so they're very much a uh, functioning part of the team. It's a, a month-long interview process. They're interviewing us, and we're interviewing them, and we want everyone to kind of have a better, a good idea of uh, uh, the, the fit. I definitely remember those radiology rounds. It can be intense, but, you know, we try not to put people on the spot uh, too much. It's kind of, you know, uh, just uh, investigating uh, the um, the patient together, really. Yeah. So so who's Certainly in one of the Oh, Go sorry, ahead. sorry, Joe. I was going to say, so uh, with, in terms of your residents, who's in charge of the clerks? Uh, is that a fair question? And, you know, like sure. making their schedule and uh, whatnot? 
So um, Dr. Brittany Rice is uh, my assistant uh, director. Um, Dr. Don Green is also assistant uh, director in a capacity. Still, he's still helping out, primarily working with the residents on uh, mostly on research. Uh, but Dr. Rice is the one who's uh, really handling the externship. Uh, she's going through the applications. Uh, she's selecting, you know, making uh, offers. Um, and then uh, beyond that, uh, we really depend on our residents to kind of um, in real time um, look and see which is the best place and what, where they're going to get the most educational uh, benefit. Well, that makes perfect sense. How about a little more about the residency program? I'm interested in hearing about the progression of your residency from first to third year. Um, it's funny because when we talk to residency directors, uh, there's a lot of different structures. Everybody gets all the work in, in over three years, but they do it in various ways. Um, do you mind sharing with us your your uh, your program, the kind of the ins and outs and, and the priorities at each year? Absolutely. So the first year is primarily the intern year. So uh, you're doing most of your off-service rotations. It's about only about two months of podiatry. Uh, the first year kind of interspersed through the other off-service rotations. So um, general vascular uh, surgery, emergency medicine, uh, regular medicine, infectious disease. Um, we actually just recently started a month of, of a, a trauma uh, rotation where uh, they're rotating uh, on uh, with the trauma service. Um, they're going through the, the Navy, um, um, pediatrics. So kind of getting all these off-service surface rotations out of, uh, out of the way, just getting exposed to the whole medicine uh, team. Um, what's really nice about uh, Scripps is that the podiatry residents are functioning on the same uh, uh, field as the, uh, the other uh, residents. So we have uh, both an internal medicine residency, uh, transitional year uh, residency, family practice. So um, our podiatry residents uh, were very much integrated with those other uh, residents um, during uh, during those uh, rotations. So it's, it's nice kind of establishing those relationships and getting uh, comfortable uh, with those other members of the team. Um, moving on to uh, as, as far as the podiatry side of things, uh, they do get a little bit of exposure to it. They're mostly going to be doing uh, the infectious uh, infection procedures, some of the forefoot and uh, elective uh, procedures. Uh, but a lot is just kind of you know uh, observing the second years, you know, working with the, uh, the upperclassmen and getting more of a better feel of uh, how things go. Uh, the second year, um, it's all pretty much all podiatry, and that's where you're, we have four-month blocks um, or three-month blocks uh, where they're rotating through um, Sharp, um, uh, Scripps, and uh, Kaiser, as well as uh, Scripps. So um, Sharp is a, a more of a, um, a, multi, a multi-specialty uh, group, same with uh, Scripps Green versus Kaiser, more of an HMO model, and then Scripps Mercy, they're seeing more of a, the private practice um, and uh, side of things as well as hospital-based side of things. So it's really great in that with this part of kind of program that you get the exposure to all these diverse uh, different types of hospital settings or different type of practice settings so that you can really get a good feel of what works best for you and what you'd be more interested in pursuing uh, once you uh, graduate. Um, and then the third year um, for the chief resident, that's pretty much mostly uh, working on cherry picking which cases that you really want to uh, focus on. So rear foot uh, trauma, uh, if you want to focus on that or forefoot, and you get to really dictate your own schedule. There are some uh, blocks that you're set on, but a lot is just floating around and kind of uh, uh, going where uh, um, the winds take you, essentially. So a lot of autonomy built into this program. Um, the more you put into it, the more you're, uh, you're going to get out of it. Uh, but it just really gives the residents more of a chance chance to kind of be the master of their destiny. Um, as far as the third year rotation and the other um, uh, sites, so Kaiser and Fontana and Ontario, um, again, that's more the that HMO uh, model to get exposed to a lot of uh, trauma and um, reconstructive surgery there. And the same kind of thing goes for Kaiser and uh, Sacramento. There's you know, a lot of attendings at both of these uh, programs where they're uh, just really sharpening uh, the saw uh, as it were and just kind of getting, trying to get them ready uh, to be uh, graduating. Oh, that's fabulous. Sounds like a great program. I want to do it. <laughs> I know. I, I want to go back and do that program. <laughs> All right. So I, I have a question for you, kind of shifting a little bit then. Uh, you're currently in a group private practice when you were talking about various different practice models. Can you talk a little bit about that experience? Sure. Um, coming out of Kaiser, I thought I was only going to be Kaiser, you know, the rest of my uh, career. You know, now, Kaiser doesn't really prepare you for <laughs> practice uh, setting this kind of its own uh, entity or model. But I was comfortable in that, you know, um, I, I, I liked to kind of just be able to do this, uh, the uh, the medicine and the surgery and not really have to work, worry about the business side. But um, business is also appealing in a different respect. So I'm a member of uh, three uh, podiatrist uh, group practice. Um, I uh, uh, 
basically I, I purchased it from uh, my share of it from the, the Green Brothers. It, it, this was really Don, originally Don Green and Dick Green's uh, practice that they started way back in the 1970s, and they've been building it uh, ever since. And it's really a turnkey opportunity uh, for me to jump into a practice that was very much well established in the community with um, all the local um, in, uh, internal medicine uh, doctors, as well as all the insurance plans. Um, the nice thing about this practice is for one, I'm working with two other uh, outstanding uh, physicians who I can uh, bounce ideas off of, who I can uh, trust to be able to cover uh, my patients when I want to uh, go on a vacation and who can help me uh, share the load of running uh, uh, the practice. And I'm also, uh, again, uh, very much uh, the master of my destiny. I can see the patients that I want to see. I can take the time off that I, I, I want to do within reason. You don't want to leave your patients hanging. Um, and then I can set up my my, my practice, uh, you know, choose the types of modalities, choose the types of, uh, you know, um, pathology that really interests me. So. Um, there's more work um, with a private practice. You have to, it's its a living, breathing thing. You have to make sure that you're nourishing uh, these um, relationships with the people who are sending you uh, patients. You have to uh, make uh, keep an, more of an eye on your reputation. But again, it's just the freedom and the, the, the high ceiling that you have with it. Um, really, uh, I would very much uh, trade that for um, being a, uh, the stability that, that you get um, with uh, um, being more of an, um, an employee. So I kind of did a 180 there and, you know, like I'm, I'm I'm, I'm very glad that I did. It's the yin and the yang. I love egg. the way you talked about. Oh, sorry. Right. Go ahead, Joe. I said, we even the, tried to work on something so that we didn't jump into each other. But I love that you talk. This is what I love about Ben is the insightfulness and the way that you talk about. Like it is a living, breathing thing. It's an entire entity to consider. And there are people that that really works well for. And there are people that mm, they get into it and they're like, you know what? I actually really don't want to manage this beast that, that has been created. And I think it's such a testament to you that of some of the most profound names in our profession, they handed that over to you. Like what a, what a statement, Ben, like what an accomplishment that the people that you trained with felt comfortable enough to say, this is the guy, this is the guy you want. And so as you made that transition from being a resident to this private group that may or may not have had all the um, training to deal with the, the new beast of a private practice. And then also taking on the load of being an assistant director, which is a big deal. How, how did, how did that go those first couple of years? It was an interesting transition. Um, I lean to your first point about being put into this position in the first place. I definitely feel blessed. You know, like I, I, I don't take it for granted that I'm in a very desirable uh, place and that um, it, it's a, a big credit to, you know, uh, it's, it's just I feel very lucky not to be here. Uh, but the, doing the transition was uh, a little bit uh, challenging in terms of it's weird being a, a peer to residents and then being a, a supervisor to residents. So <laughs> coming in, yes, call me Dr. Cullen. I'm only one year ahead of you. So um, fortunately, uh, Dr. Green, uh, you know, very much uh, kind of uh, eased me into uh, the position. Um, I was assistant director uh, for um, seven or eight years before I actually went on to become the, the director of the program. And I'm glad that I did because it's quite a monumental uh, task being the, the director, being the face of a uh, program and just um, all of the ins and outs uh, of the of the job and the responsibilities. And so um, it, it was something that I kind of was able to fortunately kind of transition over a period of, uh, of time. And there's just a lot that goes into, it, you know, uh, managing the residents, doing the schedule and then managing uh, the, uh, the administration of, you know, making sure that you're dotting your I's and crossing your T's. We just had our site visit um, last year and uh fortunately we passed it with the uh, flying colors and they're um so and don't have to worry about that for another six years because that's a a big uh, task but um uh, it was it was a uh, it's just something that you know, like anything it, it gets better with time you know like um i, I kind of just had to develop that uh, that mindset and uh supported by people around me um, beyond uh, Don Green, who really helped me out with the um, to transition to the the, uh, the academic, the, the the director part of things, uh, his brother Richard Green was uh, a legend in, in his own right in terms of being just a, a master uh, businessman and master uh, uh, clinician. So um, I was able to work with him for a couple of years. Uh, we shared an office, uh, which is some of the, uh, the the best time of my career, where you know, I was able to learn 
you know the, the practice management side of things you know how how to and, uh, navigate uh, insurances and um, and uh, working with uh, other uh, doctors in the community and just um, the the business the business of medicine. So um, I've been uh, I've had a lot of you know great support uh, around me that has really made my life a lot easier. That's interesting, Ben, because a lot of times, as you alluded to earlier, you kind of go into the same environment for practice where you were trained. So you definitely, uh, before I mentioned, it's kind of like the yin and the yang. You know, the if you're in an institution, there's a little more security, but a little less freedom. If you're on your own, you've got more freedom. But uh, you also have the high ceiling, but you also have a little more responsibility. So uh, it's good to see you're, you're, you're flexible there and can make it happen. Congratulations. And again, it's a lot different being in a group practice as opposed to being a solo practitioner. I can't, I can't imagine, you know, bless their hearts, the people who are the solo practitioners, because you're married to your practice. And um, if anything goes wrong, it's all on you versus having a couple other people to buffer, you know, the, uh, the crazy bumps in the road is uh, really nice to have that, uh, that support team. Well, well said. I agree. Yeah. So residency. We're going, to, we're going to kind of slowly go move backwards for you. So residency was in the Bay Area, uh, Kaiser Hayward program. Do you want to talk a little bit? We, we had Dr. Weinrob on recently as a guest, and he talked. He was just getting ready to go to Vietnam. And I think you were the first resident, is that right, yeah. to go with him? Yeah. yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about that experience? Yeah, no, Vietnam was fantastic. Um, so it was a week long uh, trip, and um, Dr. Kashak, Tom Kashak, is a was a podiatrist up in uh, Kaiser, Northern California, had, who had been going and um, reached out to Dr. Weinrob and uh, felt like it'd be a good fit to bring him out there. And just the pathology that we see, uh, you know, I won't go on uh, because you guys did a kind of a, a little bit of a, a, a deep dive on it for Dr. Weinrop's uh, podcast, but it's just amazing the variety of pathology that you see, um, you know, the the reconstruction uh, opportunities, the, uh, the trauma and just um you know, I was a second year resident at the time and I'm doing like all these uh, major uh, operations, correcting these, you know, incredible uh, pathologies and, you know, being the guy, the, the lead surgeon. So that was something that really helped, uh, again, kind of boost uh, my my own uh, uh, self-confidence and uh, and just something that really challenged me to, you know, uh, read up all these things that you see in the textbook and then you actually see them in yeah. uh, real life. And what I really took home from that trip was I, I, I loved the... Um, uh, that type of uh, medicine in that, you know, when you're volunteering your time and you're going out to help these people, uh, they, they're so appreciative of the care uh, that you uh, provide. It really kind of validates everything uh, that you can, uh, that goes into mess and you're being able to um, make a real difference in these uh, people's lives. Um, and just how stoic uh, that population in particular was, you know, we're doing like a pan Taylor uh, fusion on a patient and we go around on them the next day and all they have is Tylenol for post-op uh, uh, pain and say, so how you doing? She's like, yeah, doing great. Thank you so much. <laughs> and the family's right there at the bedside and everyone's uh, helping out. So yeah, I, I would definitely highly recommend that to anyone who can uh, take an advantage of doing one of these uh, surgical missions because it's really a life-changing uh, type of uh, event. Yeah. I think that's awesome. I, 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 there's so many great mission trips available now. If, you know, when I was in Miami, uh, going to the Yucatan, and they, they used to call it the Crippled Children's Project. But e every time you turn around, there's, you know, we don't know about all of them, but I'm learning and you're learning. And I mean, it's just incredible the, the willingness of tremendous doctors to go help the underserved around the world. I just, my hat's off to you for doing that. Thank you. All right. So residency, what are some other highlights or things that you loved about your program when you were in, in the program, other than the Vietnam opportunities? Sure. What did you, what did you enjoy about your training? Uh, so what really drew me to uh, the Kaiser Hayward program was that Dr. Weinrob was there. Um, he came to my school when I was a student and gave a talk and just his level of confidence and his flair and just uh, his, you know, obvious, you know, talent was what uh, I really want to surround myself. You know, I wanted to get my training uh, from him. And then um, they also had other, other host of great attendings at the Hayward program, Dr. Steenstra and uh, Daly, you know, uh, just uh, some giants in the uh, profession. So 
um, and also wanted to be in the Bay Area. My uh, wife was uh, going to uh, nursing school. She just graduated nursing school and she had gotten a job in the Bay Area. So location, location, location is very important part of it. Uh, but uh, fortunately, in the Bay Area, there's uh, several uh, training programs uh, that I had uh, my pickup, uh, or I, I was applying to, and I was uh, fortunate to uh, end up with uh, Kaiser and Hayward. Um, it's a great program, similar kind of uh, build up back then in terms of the first year more being more of an intern year and the second and third year you being um, being more of a you know, working on those more four foot rear foot. But um, again, I got a great exposure to a wide variety of pathology. I felt uh, very confident uh, at the end of it that I was able to handle just about everything that was uh, thrown at me. Um, and so um, I really appreciate the training there. And uh, again, it's just a great it was just a great atmosphere. I remember um, uh, Dr. Steenstra, I was talking to him uh, one day, we're about to scrub into a surgery, and he said, you know, don't take this uh, wrong, Ben, but you seem like you're having a really good time doing this residency. <laughs> and it's like, well, yeah, I, I'm, I'm having good and great training by people I respect and in a beautiful uh, area of the country. So um, it, it was a great experience. Um, I was uh, living in uh, Alameda, uh, which is kind of like this uh, little town, um, kind of in, in almost an oasis, I would say, I think, in the in the Bay Area that's kind of separated from uh, all the, um, the the traffic and the intensity of it. Um, and then also lived in uh, Fremont for a while and just, again, just a beautiful um, uh, area and um, a lot of opportunities uh, for, you know, cultural activities and sports and, and that type of thing. So you work hard and you play hard and, um, you know, it, it worked out well for me. Yeah, Alameda. I didn't know you lived in Alameda. It's a great little city, and it's yeah. such a. It's like a, I think technically an island, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, well, Peninsula. Yeah, so it's like buffered from like the the rest of the Bay Area almost. I think there's like an arcade museum there. There was something right. that, exactly. the video game museum. Yeah. Was, it was just terribly fascinating and somewhat random. But now the students know when they go to the Bay Area to visit, they should go check out Alameda, <laughs> and they should check out the uh, arcade museum. Hundred percent. Yeah. So what were some of the things that you were doing to enjoy your time? Um, yeah, um, my wife is a diehard uh, San Francisco Giants uh, fan. So obviously we're uh, going to those games. That's the hardest part for her to move down to San Diego is that we were moving away from uh, the Giants. So um, that she, she took it with a grain of salt. But uh, going to a lot of sports games, um, there's a lot of uh, great uh, bars and restaurants uh, uh, to go to. Um, there's a ton of um, areas and places to go to concerts. And then I'm huge on the outdoors. I, I love uh, bike riding, I love hiking. Uh, you know, being close to Tahoe is a, a really big, uh, plus of going to that uh, program and that's you know a large part why I end up you know really wanted to come to San Diego um, I have vacation here many times uh, uh, over the years and it's just a really good fortunate time and that, that position was available uh, when I was ready to come down here but um, that's you know whenever I have a day off I'm, I'm trying to be outside and um, really have a great opportunity to do that down here so I have a question. I lived in San Diego. I went to San Diego State, and uh, I, I was pulled to the ocean, but I was also pulled to the mountains, the Kuimakas, to go hiking and running trails and biking. Well, I, I saw you're a surfer. Uh, you don't strike me as a surfer, dude, but you get out and do it, I see. <laughs> I, I'm very much uh, eclectic, you know. Like um, I went, to, I went to UC Santa Cruz. I'm a fighting banana slug, and I think it's <laughs> mandatory for everyone to pick up a surfboard while, while you're there. But um, that was more of a longboarding. Um, I do a little bit of it down here. Um, I got pretty busy pretty quick when I got here in terms of the uh, the directorship and you know volunteering with all these other organizations. So um, uh, and then with the you know, children, you know, like time kind of gets to be uh, at a premium. So um, it, it's it gets a little bit harder to go out for do those kinds of things. But I don't know, it's like kind of an outworldly experience of being out on a board on the ocean and surrounded by nature. You know, like that's uh, it's, it's definitely a kind of a Zen experience for me. No. So I saw that theme. So you had UC Santa Cruz. Uh, then you had the Bay Area, which I mean, Pacifica has a surf school like, you know, so there's there it's freezing, but there is surfing. And definitely then now San Diego, so I'm like, oh, I see he's going to warmer. He's going to warmer. But then I'm like, well, the water's still cold. So it's, it's still cold. The outside in San Diego. might be warm. It's, it's, it's a thinner wetsuit down here, but it's still. Yeah. Wet suit. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Hold All on. right. So let's go to UC uh, Santa Cruz. Your bachelor's degree is in uh, bachelor's of arts in economics and psychology, which is yeah. really interesting. Tell us a little bit about your undergrad experience. So um, going from high school to undergrad, I, I had, didn't know what I wanted to do when I want, when I grew up. Uh, my mom is an anesthesiologist, and uh, my uh, father was the office manager for her uh, practice. She was initially working for a hospital, and then later on, she opened up her own pain management uh, clinic. And so he was kind of uh, the the um, 
the organization uh, behind that uh, endeavor. Um, and, and, you know, medicine kind of appealed to me as an idea, but she was not really available that much uh, going up. She worked really, really hard. She was on call every third day and um, she went on a lot of medical missions and um, she was, you know, head of the cancer society. I mean, she still, she was, uh, she, she's a Renaissance woman and you know, she's good at great at everything uh, that she did. And so um, again, anesthesiology, you know, I thought about it, but I, I didn't want to, I, I wanted more of a, a, a work-life uh, a balance. Um, as far as economics and psychology, you know, it's one of those things where um, and you go to uh, the, uh, the the center, the fair at the, the beginning of undergrad. And it's like these are the different types of electives that are available. It's like, OK, um, these two actually appeal to me. <laughs> like economics just came really naturally. It was easy. I kind of understood uh, the math uh, behind it and the um, and the ideas uh, behind it. And it's just interesting, you know, um, how um, how, you know, uh, countries interact with each other, how, um, you know, the the business uh, of, uh, uh, side of things. Um, and then same thing with uh, psychology, you know, like how people think uh, both as independently or in groups, um, how, the, uh, how we develop and, you know, just uh, the inner workings of the, the brain. So, I mean, both of those fields, they were just naturally appealing uh, to me and um, college, you know, like I, was, I looked at more of a time of, you know, inner exploration and like going into uh, going to those things that um, that interest you. Um, unfortunately, once I graduated uh, college, I was like, well, wait a minute, um, I don't want to work for a bank. <laughs> you know, I don't uh, want to just go into uh, research or, or teach a psychology. So I ended up uh, going back to the, to the career center at the towards the end of uh, my time at, at undergrad. And they said, well, what about podiatry? I said, well, what, what's that? <laughs> so I had never even heard of uh, uh, the field until I was getting close to graduating. And the more I looked into it, uh, the more it, it just really uh, sparked uh, my interest because um, I, I shouted a few uh, podiatrists and they're the happiest doctors that I, I encountered. You know, uh, they really um, were comfortable with what they were doing. They, uh, their patients really uh, were happy uh, with the, the care that they're getting, really appreciate what they did. Um, there's a great work-life balance. There's a great diversity in the types of things that they uh, go into. So um, I ended up uh, going back to uh, school for another year to take those uh, post-baccalaureate classes, the science classes that I had to take, so physics, chemistry, organic chemistry, bio. Um, so I did a year uh, going back and uh, to UC Santa Cruz and getting those classes out of the way. And uh, from there, I went and applied to um, podiatry uh, school and, and got in. Wow. Ben, I did the exact same thing. I mean, it wasn't psych, but it was, um, I didn't have all the sciences. So when I decided I wanted to be a podiatrist, next thing you know, I'm signing up for general chem one, general chem two, O chem, O chem physics. And then I went off to the California college. Yeah, I mean, science also always was interesting to me. I used to read physics and uh, books, you know, the kind of leisure, because like, you know, the, uh, the cool cartoons, of <laughs> the drawings of like the, the things in motion, that type of thing. But um, for whatever reason, I just didn't necessarily uh, consider it until uh, later on. And and then it's like, oh, wow, this is, this is great. And I feel that, you know, having the, this background of not necessarily being that purely, you know, bio uh, uh, undergrad uh, major, you know, kind of sets, uh, did help set me apart. It kind of gives me more of that uh, life experience or more of that different perspective, um, more, I feel like more well-rounded uh, having that. Um, so I think it's just a plus, uh, you know, having that on the, uh, the resume. I would say it goes back to that when I was saying, I love your perspectives on things. Like you, you, you just in the beginning, like talking about the practice is like a living, breathing thing. You, the way that you come at things is different. And we've had a couple of people with some interesting arts degrees as their background. And it, it's true. There's a completely different lens that you kind of see things and it's wonderful to like integrate various fields and oh i just think it's so interesting so it's actually not a surprise at all when i saw psychology on there but it was just interesting and then the economics part i thought well that's just this there's got to be a story back there so there you go so your career your um uh graduate career advisor is the one who actually first introduced the concept of podiatry which i think is great because we're finding that a lot of college advisors don't actually even really know podiatry or they, they don't, it's not where students are getting some of their information. So some other things we're going to transition now to, you had mentioned phases of life. You've been very busy with building the practice or, you know, taking over the practice, the residency program, but you've also been incredibly involved with 
academics and research and political organizations. Um, you've been involved with the San Diego County Podiatric Medical Society for a long time, including being the president for two years from, uh, I think it was, pull it back up here, 2019? Is that right? 2017. I thought I wrote that down. And so um, that's obviously been a, a, a huge responsibility, but you've also been the assistant chairman for the Podiatry Institute Conference, which is held every year. And if I heard correctly, you're going to be the chairman this year. Is that right? Uh, co-chairman with Mitzi Williams. Uh, she's the scientific chair and uh, the academic chair, and, and I'm more like the organizational uh, uh, chair. Fantastic. So again, a lot of different things on your plate. Can you talk about what your interest was in some of the community or political realms of our profession. Yeah, so as far as the uh, the San Diego Podiatric Medical Society, um, podiatry is such a small profession, um, and it's one of those things where I just felt that it's kind of like, you know, uh, uh, I, I wish we could all unionize, you know, I think doctors in general should like have like more strength in numbers type of thing. But uh, I think just having that collegiality, you know, like having that networking, having, having that sense of community is uh, really important so that we're not all just um, you know, on our own island. Um, with uh, the our organization, organization is primarily comprised of people in private practice. Uh, it's getting a little bit harder to uh, get through to people uh, who are more empl hospital employees, uh, that type of thing. Uh, for whatever reason, you know, uh, haven't been able to get them to be as as active. But I just felt that you know, there's especially during my time as president, I looked at it as uh, trying to be uh, kind of three pillars of you know, we want we want to encourage academic uh, development, um, uh, social development, and you know, uh, political uh, development. So um, we always uh, had uh, made sure that the residents were like giving presentations at our meetings of like inter interesting cases, and then. We also put on uh, workshops, you know, like plastic uh, uh, surgery flaps or uh, radiology or ultrasound or that type of thing. So uh, trying to stimulate uh, the academic uh, development uh, politically and was participating in the legislative leadership uh, conference up in Sacramento. So going with the CPMA and trying to uh, influence um, the lawmakers to make sure that we keep uh, podiatry um, uh, you know, moving forward as far as our um, our political uh, rights. And, and then just socially, uh, we have uh, meetings uh, every other month. Uh, um, and uh, we would have uh, um, the vendors would uh, put together our presentations that they would sponsor these nice dinners at you know, um, uh, Ruth's Chris or, you know, like some of these other like really uh, good, uh, uh, fancy restaurants. So we get everyone together in one room and we can uh, collaborate and check in with each other and just kind of uh, keep abreast. So um, I feel like it's, it's really important to, uh, again, have that uh, collegiality, have uh, everyone uh, uh, sticking together because it's, just one of those things that you know we've come a long way uh, as podiatry, and I think maybe some of the, the younger generation um, uh, doesn't necessarily appreciate you know how far we have uh, uh, come. We stand on the shoulders of giants, and um, you know it just it's just as eaten uh, what's as given is just as easily taken away. You know, so uh, I think it's important that we all stick together. Um, as far as the Podiatry Institute, that's something that's also been around since uh, I believe the early 1980s. Um, that's a joint uh, effort uh, with the uh, Podiatry Institute in Georgia, and, and they have these uh, seminars all over the country. And then uh, Don Green and Dick Green made sure that there was a, a seminar out here in San Diego, which um, our local societies uh, uh, co-organizes uh, co uh, with the Podiatry Seminar. So this is uh, an annual event. It's a, a great scientific seminar where we get uh, people from you know, uh, all over the country uh, coming in and giving great lectures and uh, you get usually about two or 300 um, attendees uh, who uh, come in. So uh, my main uh, job is to make sure that um, we are able to get people in the seats and that we are able to uh, get uh, vendors and the uh, and exhibitors in the booths uh, to help uh, support uh, the, the meeting. Um, and then working together with uh, uh, Mitzi on, on uh, collaborating and making making sure the format is uh, interesting and appealing and uh, educational for our attendees. Wow, Ben, you you touch a lot of a lot of aspects. Can I ask you a question about political ad advocacy? Sure. So, as you were very eloquent in stating the need for all of us to be involved and to go to our legislatures and. Um, to quote Randy Kaplan, who's with the PAC, with APMA, he said, if you're not at the table, you're on the table, right? I love that quote. Yeah. yeah. And what'd you? how did you get younger members involved? How did you get them to see that advocacy um, is, it's, it's like you pay today for future benefit. It's not that immediate gratification. What'd you find in, in trying to recruit younger members to, 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 to be active politically? 
Um, the biggest thing we do is make sure that the, all the residents who are coming through are uh, members of the local society and they get a, a, a seat at the at these uh, dinners. And so they're uh, working and seeing, you know, uh, the collegiality and, and, and the efforts that go in uh, to uh, keeping the, the practice moving forward. So having the residents uh, get involved is very uh, important. And, um, you know, I also kind of got that a lot of people came to uh, my school when I was a, a student and, get, and gave a presentation periodically. Um, John Chisholm, you know, one of previous uh, uh, CPMA uh, presidents is also an active member of the um, the local society. And um, I can't think of anyone more uh, politically inclined uh, than him. And he's very passionate about, you know, talking about all the different uh, bills that are uh, you know, getting processed and, you know, getting, uh, making sure that uh, we maintain our rights uh, and be able to uh, practice within our, our scope of practice. And um, so it's, it always, just for me, it, it, it was always kind of more of an innate thing. It just intuitively makes sense that, you know, you have to do your part. Um, and so uh, that's the challenge moving forward is trying, you know, to kind of uh, making sure that um, everyone uh, does as much as possible. Um, unfortunately, it's kind of one of those things is the, the 80-20 rule where, you know, 80% of the work is done, done by 20% of the people. And you just try to identify those 20% of the people and, uh, and stimulate them to keep on doing what they're doing. You know, I think it's interesting that you said you got to get them immediately upon residency because they go from having a school membership in APMA and then that is a very tenuous time when you go into residency because there's a million things going on. You know, political advocacy is the last thing on your mind. So I, I like that you get them involved early. My hat's off to you for that. Thank you. I do we think, to too, this is... Go ahead, Ben. I, we all have to do our part. Yeah. I do think that this young generation, too, you know, we were talking with Quasi, Quadi, who I know you also know, and I think that I think we will see an um, a uptick or surge in interest because they are very socially um, responsible and thoughtful and they want to be involved in things that have positive change and they want to get involved in ways to make a difference. And so I think and again, maybe it's just very silver lining optimism, but I do think that some of the generational shifts that we're seeing, I do th- anticipate we're going to have more people wanting to ask the question, what can I do? How can I be helpful? Yeah, exactly. Right. So again, as we're trying to help people find their avenues and find their opportunities, and clearly Ben, you have found opportunities at every single niche uh, that our profession offers, which is wonderful, but letting people know if they are in that 20% of people that, that get it done, Hey, get involved. Right. And there's not, you no one's going to say no. There's more work. There's so much work to be done. So there are always opportunities. But if you don't want to do all of those things, you can just find one area that really interests you and you can get involved in just that one thing. So I love the idea of being able to highlight how people can get involved in lots of different opportunities in lots of different ways. So thank you for coming in and sharing all of that. I mean, 100 percent that there are opportunities available for those who seek them. And I think probably the easiest way of exploring that is to just uh, find someone who uh, you respect and you know, reach out to them uh, because it's typically those people who are more prominent, who are more most willing to share their um, their experience and, and kind of encourage you and stimulate and mentor you to uh, to move forward. So um, it's just about, you know, having that self-motivation and, and then reaching out and it kind of really uh, steam, um, steamrolls uh, or snowballs uh, from there. Yeah. Not many snowballs in San Diego. <laughs> <laughs> Nor in Phoenix. It's been a, that's it's been a, wind, it's been a wet uh, winter. We've, we've actually had a bunch of rain this year. I can't complain, but <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> San Diego. <laughs> so, Ben, the this, this cycle of academics goes by so quickly. You know, uh, students were doing clerkships, and now the match was last week. And already I've got students scheduling time to meet with me to talk about second year students, right? They haven't even taken boards yet. They want to talk about next year's clerkships. Could you spend a couple minutes talking about what you're looking for in a clerk? Um, because I'd love to share this uh, this podcast with our students and say, you know, this is this is what your residency directors are looking for. Sure. Um, usually, I, I turn that question back to um, the uh, uh, next one will ask me that. What are you looking for? It's like, well, what do you think I'm looking for? <laughs> and then it's like, there you go. You know, it's, I, I want someone who's going to show up. Number one, you know, you got to be on time. And you have to uh, show up. And if you have a reason that you uh, you can't be there, like we have an upcoming extern who's had, wants to go to their sister's uh, nurse uh, nursing co- white coat ceremony, you know, or uh, pinning ceremony. Okay, yeah, well, you can have a day off for that. That's fine. Just communicate. <laughs> you know, like don't 
just not show up type of thing. And then we got you got to work hard. You know, you, you have to learn every day. So um, I, I when I was a, a student, I was uh, constantly being pimped. You know, and I looked at those as opportunities. It's great. You know, it kind of identifies you know the things I'm good. Also identifies the things that I need to work on. And so when I was asked a question I didn't know, I looked that up, and then I got back to my attending later on uh, that day. And you know, now I know that. And then the next time they asked me, okay, now I'm going to be very you know, scholarly and be able to quote you articles and, and tell you about that. So do your homework. Um, also investigate, um, you know, look into the program that you go into. You want to make sure uh, that you read the articles that, that in the attendees have uh, put out there. Uh, you want to kind of do your research and uh, talk to some of the residents who, ha who have been there and, and ask them, you know, uh, what the focus is on. Um, and especially uh, when you're going into any kind of surgery, you want to have read up on it and prepared. So there's a lot of easy ways of, you know, um, of showing up and doing your work and being prepared. Um, and then beyond that, it's, um, you know, uh, be relaxed. You know, it's easier said than done. Uh, but a lot of times, you know, uh, the, one of the things that can uh, turn us off is like someone who's a little assertive, you know, or, or, or aggressive. You know, there's a difference between being aggressive and being assertive. So you don't want to stand in the corner by any stretch of the imagination, but you also don't want to stand right in front of the, the doctor. Uh, so um, it's, it's that balance of making yourself obviously available without being uh, overbearing uh, about it. But uh, again, and if you kind of just, uh, go in with an open uh, frame of mind and if you can go in uh, ready to, to work and with a smile and, and you know, uh, that's that will kind of really not take you far. It's just uh, being being ready and being prepared. We, Joe, we keep running into, into that emotional intelligence aspect of life. Yeah, there's no doubt. Wow, that's great. Um, Joe, do you have any more questions? I got another one if you don't. Um, I'll let, I'll let you go. Cause oh. we're getting short on time and I've. Okay. So Ben, I have a quick question for you. Um, your thoughts on fellowships. you are you, are you encouraging your, your residents when they graduate to do fellowships? Um, are they needed? Are they not? What, what's, I mean, it's a controversial thing right now. I think it's a very personal decision uh, for uh, the resident. We do have um, several of our residents who have gone on to fellowship, and it's been a great experience uh, for them. We've got, we've got a lot of our residents who go on right to, into practice, and uh, they feel that they're uh, that that's what's uh, worked best for them. I kind of uh, look at it as a as something to add on to your CV, especially if you're looking to work with a uh, orthopedic group. I think that's something that they're really looking for is a quote unquote fellowship trained for an equal uh, surgeon. And then also if you're looking to do more very um, uh, elaborate um, types of uh, procedures in terms of, you know, total ankle replacements, uh, you're going to get a lot more experience uh, going to the fellowship um, or big, you know, Sharf, uh, Sharko uh, reconstructions, you know, uh, something that you, if you want to be very much a, a specialist specialist, uh, then uh, a fellowship is certainly going to help you. Uh, we get, we have great training uh, in this uh, program. And I feel like you're going to be ready for just about pretty much everything, but those would be uh, kind of like total ankle replacements and, you know, and maybe like um, uh, Charco, you know, those would be the things that um, you, you'd probably be able, you'd be comfortable doing it, but you'd be a lot more comfortable after, you know, doing the fellowship and getting that experience. But um, again, uh, I think that's just kind of up to uh, the, the resident uh, themselves, whether they feel uh, that's something that uh, they want to, you know, uh, uh, pursue. And again, also it's just going to help them uh, with a, in the job market, which is, you know, always uh, going to be a, a competitive thing. Absolutely. Well said. I agree a hundred percent. All right. So my last question for you, it was a fun fact that I didn't know until I got your CV. You are multilingual. Where did you learn your skills and what languages do you speak? Uh, primarily Spanish. I, I dabble a little bit in French. Um, I was fortunate growing up uh, to uh, learn Spanish. Well, my my mother speaks like 14 languages, and it's crazy. Um, and then um, both my older brothers uh, learned uh, Spanish, and uh, we went on a lot of trips, uh, these medical missions to these Spanish-speaking uh, countries, and um, it's just something that I took in school and, and then I kept up with. Um, certainly, you know, coming to San Diego, it's been a very important part of uh, my acumen is to be able to speak Spanish because uh, there's a lot of proximity a lot of um, my patients, uh, that's all they speak exclusively. Um, but I definitely did have to um, look at some medical uh, medical Spanish uh, books to kind of uh, bone up on those things, learn what a Juanete, uh, you know, Bunyan is. Um, and, uh, um, uh, but, you know, it, it, I can't imagine being in a foreign country and not 
being able to speak the language and being in a situation where you have a medical problem and then just kind of at the mercy of the uh, the people around you. So, I mean, translators are great, uh, but some things are, are lost in translation. Sometimes they're uh, not accessible all the time. Uh, so um, I, I definitely would encourage anyone uh, who has that interest to, you know, develop a, another uh, language because it just really helps and set you apart and really helps, you know, uh, you be able to uh, practice better with other populations. So when you went with your mom to some of these medical mission trips, what were the things that you were able to do? Very little. Uh, I, was really, I was a young kid at the time, so I was mostly uh, observing um, and, you know, uh, just kind of uh, uh, helping out with, like, gathering supplies. And, yeah. you know, like, I was more of a, uh, you know, uh, moving things from one place uh, to the other. But just a lot of observing. And, you know, she did these things like cleft palates and, um, you know, like a lot of uh, things uh, like that. So um, it was just, uh, again, helping out where I could. That's fantastic. That is fantastic, Ben. Well, gosh, uh, we really appreciate you carving out an hour out of your day in the beginning of the week. Mondays are usually busy. Uh, thank you so much, Ben, for joining us. And uh, I want to send you one of these Dean's Chat cups. Um, you're a busy guy. I'll bet you drink some caffeine, maybe. Amen to that. All right. Sounds <laughs> good. Uh, so all of our listeners on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, please give us a five-star rating. And of course, if you're on YouTube, we'd love for you to be a subscriber. And um, Ben, we get about 10 to 1 views on YouTube compared to regular podcasts. So um, so you're not they're not just going to hear your voice. They're going to see, see, see you in the interview. And uh, we really appreciate you and for being on the, on the show. And I look forward to working with you down the road with more students. This is going to be a required viewing by my residents, so I appreciate it. <laughs> and our students. Fantastic. All right. Thanks, Ben. All right. Thank Cheers, you so much. Cheers, everyone. Take care.